All right, welcome back, everybody. It's been a little while since I did a video for you, so here we go. Another one from the world of the IETF RFC. And this week, the featured RFC or RFCs will be RFCs 1122 and 1123. We've been talking a lot about the the protocols and the RFCs that go with those particular protocols, but this actually happens to be the pair of RFCs that refer to the TCP IP model, or what we'll just call our, our uh, IETF flavored model. But of course, it, it covers all of the protocols that we see in the IETF RFC. And namely, what we're talking about are those things above layer two. Because when we get down to layer two and then below, what we're really talking about is the, uh, the local area network protocols. And here are the cover sheets for these two. Uh, there's a lot of similarity between them, but we can see that uh, while they're both requirements for internet hosts, one, 11.22, is really about the communication layers. So all of those sub layers that are designed to get you from your local area network protocol up to the application, and then we have the requirements for internet hosts, application layer, and above. And thrown in there is this idea of support. And we'll see later on that that's really about DNS. All right, so here's some of the uh, the big points about these two RFCs. So 1122, it is really about, as I said earlier, the layers that are or that contain sort of our protocols. So the things that you're going to find described in 1122 are going to be specific to the link layer protocol. And really what it's after there is the encapsulation format, how you actually take data and stick it in a local area network frame, and of course IP, or IP version 4 in this case, in the early days here, fabulous 1980s era when all of this stuff comes from, and uh, ICMP, IGMP, uh, ideas or thoughts on routing, uh, UDP, and TCP. Now it's really kind of uh, important to remember that we spent some time talking about the RFCs that are specific to protocols. So this document is about a lot of the ideas and the requirements for these particular protocols. But of course, it's incomplete because it doesn't have all of the rules and, you know, it doesn't have all of the messaging and all of that stuff. But it does give you a really, really good sense of what's required at each layer and then has some very specific ideas for each one of the protocols. Now, 1123 is all about what goes on at the application layer and then the requirements for those kinds of connections and some of the ideas that you want specific to just the applications. And then there's the support of the applications, which in this case, it really means DNS, and the importance of the ability to use not only uh, IP addresses, but names, or what we might for, refer to as namespaces. So what we're dealing with here are host names and numbers, uh, Telnet and FTP, TFTP, mail, SMTP, and, and then of course the DNS stuff. So a little more on the ideas, you know, that uh, one of the reasons that it was fun looking at this RFC again is because we sometimes forget where a lot of our ideas come from, how many people were involved in getting these ideas sort of put down to paper. And then this RFCs or this pair of RFCs includes many of the reasons why we do the things that we do. So the requirements, the musts and the shoulds that are involved in each one of each one of these layers. And also a really good overview if you're trying to understand why we do the things that we do. So I would encourage anybody that's in the networking world to read chapter or section one in 1122 or 1123. It turns out that they're the same. But when you get to 1123, I would also say, hey, go ahead and read uh, section two because it talks about some of the requirements for these connections. Some ideas that we see here is that routing is a complex and difficult problem. It ought to be performed by the gateways and not the hosts. And so there's this whole section on source routing and, and why we why that's problematic. Um, and that's just an example of what part of the discussion was at layer three. 1123, because we're talking about applications, we want to be able to map names to IP addresses. We want to be able to figure out what folks are sad, sending and how to, how to interpret it. So is the proper syntax being used or what is being used? And then, of course, there's this whole really interesting problem of what happens if my host is connected to more than one IP-based network? Here are some of the fun things that I, I pulled out of these particular two RFCs. The one that jumps out at me for 
RFC 1122 is this whole confusion at layer two. We have to remember that our models don't specify individual protocols, although certainly with the TCP IP model, a lot of the protocols are sort of picked for us. But what do you do at layer two? Well, first of all, let's deal with the name. Um, we call it in this particular RFC, the link layer. Most people talk about the data link layer, but that's not the phrase used in this particular in, in this particular RFC. And even I like to use the phrase network layer or, or link layer because um, we're dealing with things that are on a local area network, meaning that it doesn't go beyond the router. So I sometimes use link layer and network layer interchangeably, um, although maybe I'll modify my behavior after this. Now at the, uh, the lower layers, we're talking about really two different kinds of Ethernet. We've got Ethernet Type 2, or what was called the Early uh, Digital Equipment Corp uh, Xerox model, and that's, that's what we see used for data. But then of course we've got the IEEE 802.3 Ethernet flavor, and they're not exactly the same. So there are two related RFCs that describe the encapsulation in these two Ethernet formats. And the funny thing to me was that um, encapsulation in Ethernet Type 2 was a must. Encapsulation in 802.3 was a should, although today NICs understand both of them. Uh, each section has a requirements list, so you can go right down and, and see that each layer says, you know, you must be able to do this, you should be able to do that, and so on and so forth. 11.23, it was written long enough ago that uh, Telnet and FTP were the protocols of choice. So SSH wasn't even a thing at this point. So while you kind of go, I'm not doing Telnet, there is an awful lot there that provides guidance on connection control. What you should do uh, in the case of, you know, for example, your extended connections, flushing, uh, keyboard strokes, and, and all of that stuff. Now TFTP is covered with this, or at least a discussion on TFTP, and uh, we still use TFTP today. It's used in a lot of, lot of systems that do automatic updates, for example, voice over IP. And TFTP has this nice little thing that they talk about called the Sorcerer's Apprentice Syndrome. And the idea is all about duplication. So if you remember at Disney's Fantasia, you know, Mickey Mouse creates a whole bunch of extra brooms to help him do his work, and all of a sudden he's got brooms and brooms and brooms and brooms creating brooms. And so the idea here is that if you create a duplicate message because of a timeout or because you want to respond to an error, and then the other side can not only have duplicate responses, but might respond more than once to a particular message. And so it just sort of runs away. And that's the sorcerer's apprentice syndrome. All right, to wrap this up, we're getting a little long here. So some fun quotes, we'll read them together. The internet architecture generally provides little protection against spoofing of IP source addresses. So any security mechanism that is based upon verifying IP source address of a datagram should be treated with suspicion. And it turns out that we do this kind of stuff all the time with firewalls and ACLs and things like that. Uh, of course, the famous, be liberal in what you accept and conservative in what you send. Uh, in other words, don't send a whole lot of stuff to the network, but be willing to take just about any kind of traffic you see. The most serious problems in the internet have been caused by unenvisaged mechanism triggered by low probability events, meaning that they were not foreseen. Holy cow, did you see what just happened? Mere human malice would never have taken so devious a course. Ha ha ha. So good faith implementation of the protocols that was produced after careful reading of the RFCs and with some interaction with the internet technical community and that followed good communication software engineering principles should differ from the requirements of this document in only minor way. So read the doggone RFCs, talk to the folks, and implement these, and you should be pretty spot on, just like everybody else. Well, this has been RFCs 1122 and 1123. I hope you enjoyed our little discussion of these two RFCs that describe our models. And this is an IETF RFC series, uh, but I suppose I could talk about the OSI model just a little bit, or at least the standard. We'll see, maybe. When you're looking at RFCs, don't forget to look at the references. They have a lot of good stuff there. And, and earlier, I when we were talking about uh, the layer two or link layer encapsulation, there's a reference there to the early Ethernet standard, the one that sort of governs how we do most of our data encapsulation. So don't forget to look at those. Lots more good people were involved in these RFCs, of course. 
Hey, I put BruceArtPence.com down here because I just redid the site. Uh, let me know what you think. Hopefully things are easier to find. And you'll uh, see the links to the videos and, and other works there. Well, thanks very much for watching. Thanks for listening. And may your packets always reach their destinations.